First of all, I want to welcome all of you to our first annual George Edgecombe Society Research Update. Uh, I'm Lee Green. I'm one of the vice presidents at the Moffitt Cancer Center, and we are so excited that you've joined us tonight to learn more about how the Ed George Edgecombe Society supports health disparities research and importantly, address and make an impact on cancer disparities in the Black community. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you, uh, since this is a traditional uh, Zoom meeting, that you mute your microphones to reduce uh, any background noise. And if you have any questions, I invite you to ask them in the chat. So we have people who are monitoring the chat uh, all night. So let's get started. Uh, we have a wonderful program in store for you today. And before I move on, I have to say a huge thank you to Kanisha Avery, who you will see on the call tonight. Uh, she is from the Office of Community Outreach and Education and Equity, uh, who did all of the heavy lifting for the program that uh, you will experience tonight. So we should all give her a big virtual round of applause. Uh, so, so I am uh, just so pleased and so excited to introduce our new president and CEO who um, is just coming up to his first 100 days at the Moffitt Cancer Center, Dr. Patrick Hu, uh, he, and also our center director and executive vice president, uh, Dr. John Cleveland, uh, who would like to just take a few moments to welcome you and to share a few words about Moffitt's commitment to diversity, inclusion, and closing the cancer disparities gap in the Black community. So over to you, Dr. Hu. Thanks so much, Lee. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm just truly honored to be attending tonight's virtual event and look forward to meeting you in person in the near future. As the new president and CEO of Moffitt, I'm really enjoying my time meeting with everyone who shares our mission to bring an end to cancer. In my few months of working at the Cancer Center, I've been so impressed by the commitment and passion of our team members and the community that supports us and the George Edgecombe Society is no exception. I don't have to tell you that as we have developed advancements in cancer research, progress in the black community has been slower. It's a serious issue that must be addressed and I am proud of the work that Moffitt has done over the past 15 years to be a leader in closing the gap in health disparities from access and screening to clinical trial participation and research to better understand underlying genetic differences. And disparities research funding through the George Edgecombe Society helps to better address all aspects of health disparities. Since 2017, when the society was founded, six pilot projects spearheaded by Moffitt investigators have been funded for a total of $400,000. This research will help us better understand, treat, and prevent cancers that disproportionately affect the Black community, such as pancreatic, prostate, or breast cancers. This research is incredibly important to our mission and will ensure all people have equal access to life-saving care. The collective work across the Cancer Center speaks to Moffitt's commitment to health equity. Thank you for bringing awareness to an issue that would otherwise go unnoticed. I look forward to working with all of you in closing the gap on health disparities. John? Thank you, Dr. Hu. So it's a uh, pleasure to be here tonight and thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm here on behalf of research to tell you that uh, health disparities is front and center, a priority for us. Uh, the number one and number two priorities of the Cancer Center moving forward in the strategic research initiatives are community outreach and engagement and health disparities. That's number one and number two out of about six that we've laid out. And so we view this as really central to our mission. Um, NCI views cancer centers these days through a microscope that is focused on what we give back to the community and what can we do to reduce health disparities. Um, in the near future, it is likely to become the seventh, the seventh uh, essential characteristic of a cancer center support grant. And so it's extremely important that we really tackle this issue and do so in meaningful ways. And the George Edgecombe Society has been um, basically a foundation for developing those programs and supporting that kind of research that we really need to do here. So I want to just hit a few high points is that we are increasing 
you know, what we're doing in health disparities research. A good example is myself. I mean, before I came to Moffitt, I never worked on the problem, but now I have robust programs that are working on uh, health disparities in African-American men with prostate cancer, trying to define biomarkers that are associated with aggressive disease in African-American men, and to define new targets that we can use to target uh, aggressive prostate cancer disease in African-Americans. And so one of the things that we really wanna do is not only do research that defines those genetic differences, but then roll out clinical trials that specifically tailors uh, addressing that health disparity by reaching out into the community and developing, designing, and then delivering those cancer, those clinical cancer trials to help prevent the progression of a otherwise deadly malignancy. So we're expanding our outreach and engagement efforts of research faculty uh, with the Black community. This is being done so done in collaboration with Lee Green and is being led by Susan Vadaparampal. She's the associate Dir director, associate center director of community outreach outreach engage, engagement and equity. And equity was the thing that Susan added to this title. And so she feels very, very passionate about getting equity into our community and making sure that our research really is, imp is impacting our community and especially our black community where we're, there is large disparities in several diseases. Um, George Edgecombe Society is facilitating large team science grants and so is the Cancer Center. So we're, we're investing monies that we get from the state to support SPORE grants and program project grants that are addressing health disparities. And I think this is, a, this is something that you know, is a strength at Moffitt. We actually have a very deep bench of research that are tackling health disparities. And so we can really put together very compelling large team science grants that NCI wants to fund. Um, we want to identify and remove barriers to enhance enrollment of diverse populations in clinical trials accruals. And so a new office is being established under Susan Vadaparampal's office that will deal specifically with making um, accrual of underrepresented minorities a priority uh, of her office. Uh, so in addition to uh, you know, funding research products you will hear about today, George Edgecombe Society is helping to increase diversity amongst our research faculty workforce. Uh, we well recognize that hiring black faculty is extremely important to have impactful outreach into our community. Um, life experience of black faculty is different than a white faculty member. And so it's just, just logically, it makes sense that the best way to get community outreach is to really hire talented black faculty into our ranks. And so we're dedicated to doing that. And so every search committee now that we put out for faculty and research, whether it be in basic population, quantitative science or clinical science, uh, the search committees are required to be diverse and required to uh, consider both gender and equity um, if, of candidates. And that's actually a requirement now of the cancer center. So that's been rolled out across all of research. So we, you know, have an, in, we're, our recruitments are very intentional of bringing in black faculty. And so George Edgecombe um, Society actually helps in that endeavor because they've established a George Edgecombe Scholar Award. And George Edgecombe Scholar Awards is meant to attract black faculty with interest in health disparities research. Specifically, it's focused primarily on health disparities in African Americans and Blacks. Um, it's also to promote the engagement of uh, novel health disparities research across the Cancer Center. And it offers $75,000 to uh, the, the generous startup packages that we already provide. And I just wanna call out the George Edgecombe so Society for funding the first George Edgecombe inaugural scholar who is Dr. Tiffany Carson, who comes to us from the University of Alabama at Birmingham as an associate member. Uh, Dr. Carson is an established investigator who brings two R01 grants. Those are, those are basically the coin of the realm in the research world that says that you're really at the top, top tier. And Tiffany certainly is that. And she is specifically laser focused on reducing racial disparities in obesity and cancer. Because if you don't know it, obesity is actually the number two risk factor uh, for, a, for getting cancer behind uh, smoking. So we're really pleased that Tiffany joined us just last month as the George 
uh, Edgecombe Society inaugural scholar. And we think she's gonna be the first of many. So we aspire to hire many more faculty that um, are black and are working on health disparities because we think this is clearly a route by which we can accelerate our impact in our black community. Back to you, Lee. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hu and Dr. Cleveland. And I think, as many of you know, we cannot do this work with of uh, inclusion, equity, health disparities without the support of our most senior leaders. And so we're very fortunate uh, to have leaders like Dr. Hu and Dr. Cleveland who get it and who understand how important this work is. So thank you both for being here tonight. And more importantly, thank you for your incredible uh, support. Uh, to help me in uh, providing some background on the George Edgecombe Society is Valerie Goddard. Valerie, who is uh, no stranger in the uh, Tampa Bay community, uh, is the CEO of the Goddard Group, which serves clients in education as well as healthcare. Uh, Valerie is currently leading a national foundation for community impact with about a $30 million endowment. Uh, Valerie is a founding member uh, and the chair of the George Edgecombe Society. Uh, she serves at Moffitt in a significant way. Uh, she's on the Institute Board. Uh, she's on the Moffitt Hospital Board. Uh, she's also co-chair of the PR and Marketing Advisory Committee. So Moffitt is like her second job. Uh, so Valerie, thank you so much for being here tonight and for providing a little bit of the history of the George Edgecombe Society. So over to you, Valerie. Good evening, and thank you, Lee, for the introduction. I am uh, just honored to serve at Moffitt. It is like a second home for me. The work that we do at Moffitt each and every day is life-changing. And so I'm glad that each one of you have joined tonight as well. For some, this evening's event may be your introduction to the George Edgecombe Society. For others, this may be a reminder as to the purpose and mission of the George Edgecombe Society. But no matter your relationship with the George Edgecombe Society, we hope tonight that this will begin the start of your engagement and your support with the society this year and in years to come. A little background information. The George Edgecombe Society was established in 2017 in honor of Tampa Bay's first black judge in Hillsborough County the Honorable George Edgecombe. Judge Edgecombe died of cancer in 1976, and his death inspired his close friend, H. Lee Moffitt, for whom Moffitt Cancer Center is named. It inspired uh, Lee Moffitt to create what has become the only National Cancer Institute Comprehensive Cancer Center in Florida. So you can see that the George Edgecombe Society from, from its inception, uh, by devoting itself a commitment to this great work, has honored the legacy of George Edgecombe, and we continue to keep it alive by addressing cancer health disparities. We thank Ms. Edgecombe and her daughter, Allison, for enabling us to have the honor to continue that legacy through this great work. Our membership is open to all, and working together with the steering committee, donors of the George Edgecombe Society, help to advocate to eliminate health disparities in the African-American community, promote Moffitt's clinicians and researchers and their work, and importantly, award financial support for the research and clinical efforts of scientists focused on cancer health disparities. But it's important for me to point out this evening as well that from inception, the steering committee knew that we could not do this great work alone. It took a three, pronged approach. The leaders, the committed individuals on our steering committee, the entire Moffitt Cancer Center team, and the Tampa Bay community. And from our beginning, we started with the community in mind, with events that were designed to engage the community, to invite them to be a part of Moffitt Cancer Center and come on campus, to be able to meet and interact with our clinicians and our researchers and see the campus and all the wonderful work that goes on here. Additionally, we partnered with the George Edgecombe Bar Association and had an event that highlighted the great work that we're doing here on cancer health disparities. And we had over 800 Tampa Bay uh, members in attendance from the legal community, 
from community residents, corporations, business people, every sector of our community was engaged. And that enabled us to take this great work to a broader platform and to make a statement that Moffitt Cancer Center is focusing on cancer health disparities and focusing on the African-American community. This evening, our focus is on highlighting the cancer health disparities research on ovarian, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. This will also allow you to engage and interact with Moffitt's researchers and clinicians in the breakout sessions so that you can get questions answered. So tonight's not the time to be shy. As you hear the amazing research and the impact that it's having on the lives of those that they're working with, this is an opportunity for you to ask questions, to share your thoughts, to interact with our clinical and researchers in ways that maybe you've not had before. So we invite you to speak up tonight. There is no bad question. The only bad question is the one that you do not ask. So we're excited that you are here. We're proud of the great work of the George Edgecombe Society, and we've only just begun. Working hand in hand with you all and with the Moffitt team, we are committed and passionate to continue this great work and to continue the legacy of the late George Edgecombe. He was a trailblazer and this effort is blazing new trails in cancer research. So with that, now Lee, I will turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Valerie, for that history. And uh, this started as an innovative idea that we worked hard on. And here we are tonight, uh, have raised money to get research projects funded, uh, projects that we hope and pray that one day will be life-saving uh, because that is what this is all about. Uh, and speaking of raising money uh, for George Edgecombe, I would like to introduce Lauren Rucker, who is the George Edgecombe liaison from the Moffitt Foundation. Uh, Lauren is here to make a very special presentation. Uh, so over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, and good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren, um, and I have a pivotal update uh, for the George Edgecombe Society. I'm so grateful to be able to share this information with you. Um, as we know, um, the entire week, we all have been celebrating the, the city of Tampa, the Super Bowl. Uh, the George Edgecombe Society has been celebrating for a different reason, and um, for one particular reason would be a gift that we received uh, right before um, the Bucks went to the Super Bowl from a William Golston Jr. Uh, and he is a defensive end for the Buccaneers. Um, he is actually with us today um, on the call. And uh, the donation we received from Mr. Golston was $225,000. Um, this amazing gift uh, will go, and I'm sure if we were not virtual, we would all be in standing ovation right now. Um, but Mr. Golson, we are so appreciative for your amazing gift that will go to breast, colon, and prostate research for uh, the Black community. Um, the gift was made in honor of his family, uh, his late father and uncle, as well as his mother, who is a surviving uh, breast cancer survivor, as well um, as his uncle, another uncle as well. Um, the, the gift, of course, is, is to just push forward the George Edgecombe uh, legacy and continue to trailblaze. Um, and from this point on, we'll be all be saying go Bucks with a little bit more passion. Um, so we are so thankful and we cannot say enough how we thank you, William. Um, I'll leave it back to you, uh, Dr. Green. Great. So I, I have to say on behalf of the uh, Moffitt family and the entire community, uh, we just thank you for your commitment to addressing cancer disparities, uh, William, and I can say that the researchers who will be provided um, with this funding uh, will be so grateful because they, they cannot do what they do uh, without uh, funding. So we cannot thank you enough. And uh, we also want to just thank you for dominating the uh, Chiefs uh, on uh, Sunday and bringing the Lombardi Trophy to the city where it belongs. So Congrats to you and to the entire Tampa Bay Buccaneers organization. Oh, what my goodness, you all made us so, so very uh, proud. And uh, by the way, uh, if William is still on and listening, 
Uh, we hope that we will be in line to have the trophy displayed at the Moffitt Cancer Center in the near future. So William, if we can work with Lauren to make that happen, that would be awesome. Um, Cause I've never been next to the uh, Lombardi trophy. So uh, let's make that happen. So thanks again for your generosity. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, so in planning this event, it was uh, no coincidence that we chose to uh, host it in the month of February. Uh, we want to pause at this time and officially acknowledge February as being Black History Month with the commendation from the Tampa City Council members, Orlando Goods, Charlie Miranda, and Joseph Citro. You know what, before I move on, I wanna make sure, uh, Lauren, uh, before I move on to this next thing, uh, does William want to say anything to our group? Do you know? Uh, William, are you still on? I, I don't want to pass you by if, if you want to say I something. Am. Are you here? Oh, wonderful. Yeah. You want to say a few words to the uh, crowd? Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to help with the advancement and the research. Um, and thank you all for being able to watch the game and be proud to be Tampa Buccaneers because you are a part of the community as well. And uh, I definitely try to get that to happen for you to bring the trophy to so it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you for being here. Uh, we, we, we know you must be busy uh, with the aftermath of uh, winning the Super Bowl. So the fact that you're taking time out to join us tonight means, uh, means a lot. So we really appreciate it. Uh, so I was saying that uh, we wanted to uh, pause at this time to um, officially acknowledge that this is uh, Black History Month. And the city of Tampa has provided us with a commendation uh, from council members Orlando Goods, Charlie Miranda, and Joseph uh, Citro. Uh, so I think Kanisha has a video uh, that she'd like to share uh, from those council members. Kanisha, can you roll the video? Hello, I'm Councilman Charlie Miranda, and these are my two fellow council members. To my right, Mr. Orlando Goods. To my left, Mr. Joseph Citro. City Council sends this regret that we cannot participate in your virtual event on February the 11th, but we will be sitting as Tampa City Council on that date. It is, however, our pleasure to present this combination on behalf of local options for his treatment at the time. And the loss of Judge Eskimo at age 33 inspired Honorable H. Lee Moffitt to create a premier cancer center in Florida. In 2017, Moffitt Cancer Center was committed to addressing cancer health disparities and created the George H. Cone Society so that its donors could help by funding Moffitt Cancer Center research studies to address these issues. We appreciate the George Edgecombe Society at Moffitt Cancer Center hosting this virtual event on February 11th, 2021 to highlight the advances of the cancer health disparities research and its impact on black, black African-American community. And through this event, Moffitt hopes to disseminate research findings, increase our communities and partners understanding of the importance of cancer health disparities research and ensure that their research benefits the black African-American community. And the Tampa City Council joins with Moffitt Cancer Center in recognizing the month of February 2021 as Black History Month, and it shares its interest in bringing public awareness to cancer, health disparities being faced by the Black African American community, and the importance of cancer health disparities research, and in so doing, presents this combination on this February the 8th, 2021. Outstanding. So many thanks to uh, council members Goods, Miranda, and Citro uh, for taking time out to create that video so that we could share that with you all tonight. Uh, so next we have uh, Dr. Susan Vataparampal, who is the Associate Center Director of the Office of Community Outreach, Engagement, and Equity. And we also have Dr. Clement Guede, who's a senior member in the Health Outcomes and Behavior Program and is also the chair of the Florida Cancer Control and Research Advisory Council. So they're here tonight to provide an overview of health disparities affecting the black community and to share how Moffitt is helping to address and close these disparities gaps. So over to you, Susan and Clement. 
so much. Kanisha, can you bring up our slides? Thank you so much, Dr. Green. And thank you to the leadership for that commitment to addressing cancer health disparities in the Black community in our area. I am Clement Guede, I'm going to go first and I will quickly summarize uh, a little bit of the, the, the picture about uh, the deepest uh, cancer health disparities we see, the gap for the Black community in comparison to whites, for example. And then Dr. Susan V will talk about some of the uh, initiatives we are doing to address that. Next slide. So when we look at our own area, the community that is served by Marfet, we see many, many trends that speak to disparity or underserved populations. But today we are focused, of course, for the good reason Dr. Green laid out on the Black African-American community. But I did want to say, although we have these factors or areas or populations that are different going from race, ethnicity, gender, age, rurality, and uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, status, including uninsured in those examples, we, can, we all know that black community are all those things in addition to their race. So we do want to remember that we are dealing with a complex interaction and intersection of factors. But today I just want to highlight about the black community that is served by Moffitt, what are some of the features we see. We see on the right hand that side that the, we see significant cancer health disparities that I will show you in a minute. And they also, African-Americans constitute a smaller percentage of Moffitt patient population. There is low participation in this group with regards to research in general, but particularly clinical trials right. prevent, cure, or, or treat disease, disease, treat cancer. The last point is very important. We heard already about partnerships and, and invitation to come to Moffitt. Moffitt doors are open for all. These often say that the black community is hard to reach through a outreach and education. But I think we can flip the paradigm and say, we need to develop trusted infrastructure and practices for reaching this population effectively. Because when we do, that community can benefit from all the discovery. So here we have a, a very quick illustration of some of the gap that was talked about. The gap between the death rate and uh, from all cancer when blacks are compared to whites. So if we look at the year 1990, the difference or that gap between the two populations was 33% with blacks more likely to die from cancer overall. And the good news right now is we made tremendous progress due to technology to improve screening and early detection and technology to improve our cancer treatments the gap is now shrunk in 2016 to about 14 percent. We've made tremendous progress cutting that gap by half. The challenge is that we need to do more progress. A lot more is needed and some of the initiatives Moffitt is doing will help towards ending this disparity gap. So here's an example of the range of differences or gap between blacks and whites. Here again, we are comparing the death rates between whites and blacks for different cancer sites. As you can see from the left-hand side with pancreas, uh, we only took those that are above uh, 1.1 is sort of saying it's equal. When it's above one, then the, the, the difference it, it becomes to, begins to become important. So for pancreatic, we see that this 10% greater mortality or risk for mortality among blacks. And if you go to the right-hand side, for example, a common disease, prostate cancer, it's almost two and a half times greater or 131% greater mortality for blacks. So the many questions are asked about is why is this difference existence and what can we do about, about it? And fortunately, in all these disease sites at Moffitt, we have teams of individuals that range from basic science, clinicians, population science, working together, trying to answer those questions as disparities. So what is the cause of these disparities? There are numerous causes, they're not one solution. 
And these are very familiar. They cause disparities in many other areas beyond cancer. And if you look from environmental factors, behavioral factors, the main point I want to talk about is that in all these areas, including cultural factors, we have both behavioral scientists and other researchers trying to answer and understand how these factors impinge and drive on these disparities, specifically what it is we can do to address them. If you look at the far bottom right is the area of biomarkers and biology that drives aggressive cancer and understanding genetics as it relates to causality or causing occurrence of, of specific cancers, as well as how we can use genetics and biomarkers to understand both prevention modalities, screening and early detection modalities, as well as treatment or therapeutics. And it is in this particular area that you're going to make is that it's very important for the black community to participate in research, both population science or prevention research, as well as therapeutics, so that again, we can increase those benefits from the treatments and prevention modalities to again, address that gap. So as we go through the rest of the night, hopefully we can interact in talking about ways we can increase the participation and trust in the black community to participate in research that will help us advance and end disparities. As Dr. Gwede laid out very nicely, um, there are a, a lot of areas where we hope that we can leverage the expertise of Moffitt to start to address um, or to, to continue to address cancer health disparities. One of the things that I like to do, I'm a numbers person, I kind of like to see where we stand and where our baseline is. So uh, we did just a quick survey of our faculty to see how many people are focused in different areas and different communities where we know there are cancer disparities. So I think the, uh, that a good news and good starting point is that we have lots of faculty who are engaged in cancer disparities research across the board. And in fact, 20% of the faculty who responded to our survey said that they were specifically working on cancer uh, disparities research in the Black or African American community. And that was across the board. So that was all the different types of programs and research that you see. But to me, that's sort of step one. That's going to be our baseline. And I want to see that number grow. And GES is just the mechanism to get more of our brilliant scientists to understand what the problems are in the community and to um, begin to um, um, address. Another tool or resource that we have used um, with regard to uh, 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 disparities in the Black community is to create tools for our um, team members to help them uh, quickly identify where are the areas that um, disparities exist. And we call that the Moffitt Cancer Center catchment area profile, so that you can, as a basic scientist, as a population scientist, pick up a tool, uh, pick up a, a book and be able to really start to identify where the key areas that are. We wanted to do was to establish with the GES um, how it is that we can engage more of our researchers. And so we started off, as Dr. Green mentioned, with a concept and an idea, which was how do we encourage the folks at Moffitt to understand and to take on this important issue. So back in 2018, we started this pilot program process. In 2018, we started with uh, two grants funded at $50,000 each. And those are the two people that you're gonna hear from today. So Dr. Jenny Permuth and Dr. Kashje Yamoa, two of our rising stars and, or I should say they've risen. Um, they are our stars um, focused on cancer health disparities. Since that time, we've funded an additional um, uh, four, six more, uh, four more applications. Um, and so the nice thing is that GES also appreciates the value of this mechanism, and you all suggested 
that we increased the number to um, $75,000 per uh, per grant. And we realize that we are stewards of these funds, that it is critical that we are doing our best to ensure that this research is going to make an immediate impact. And so over the course of the last three years, I have some great numbers, six grants, 16 submitted, seven that are currently under review, $400,000 that has been dedicated to research specifically in the Black community. And because of your engagement and support, this has lent itself to many offshoots, including the GES Scholar Program that Dr. Green talked about. We are very excited. Um, we're in the beginning stages of developing a speakers bureau that's specific to the Black community so that um, as we work out the logistics of how to do this um, well and to engage with all of you, that we'll be able to provide more cutting edge information uh, to the Black community. And we also are thinking about our screening programs, our access. Um, Dr. Green always talks about widening Moffitt's doors. And really all of these efforts are an initiatives to do that so that our whole community feels welcome, feels valued, and you see that you are a priority for us. So I have the pleasure today of introducing two of our um, most outstanding investigators um, that have been funded by the GES, Dr. Jennifer Permuth, who is Vice Chair of GI Oncology and Associate Member in the Cancer Epidemiology Program, and Dr. Kasje Yamoa, who is an associate member in cancer epidemiology and a physician in our radiation oncology um, program. And they're each going to tell you about their respective areas um, when it comes to the research that was funded by George Edgecombe Society. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I'd like to thank the George Edgecombe Society for this grant funding and for the opportunity to speak about my team's research with the Black community. Next slide, please. So last year, the world lost a giant in the fight uh, for civil rights when Congressman John Lewis lost his life to stage four pancreatic cancer. He once said, when you see something that's not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something and you have to do something. Next slide, please. And I feel strongly, as do many of our colleagues here at Moffitt, that we must take action and seek health equity for our Black community who's disproportionately affected by pancreatic cancer, as well as other gastrointestinal cancers, such as colon cancer. Um, I feel that as an epidemiologist, which is my background, um, I can be well suited to lead this charge because in my profession, we're kind of like detectives. We try to put puzzle pieces together to figure out why cancers occur. Um, so our team here is committed uh, to working with the black community to design studies to prevent cancer, to detect it early, to try to treat it successfully with the end result of trying to minimize disparities and improve outcomes for our population. And uh, I think that many things fuel my fire and fuel my passion for wanting to advance cancer research. It's fueled by the hope we wanna bring to our patients and their loved ones. It's fueled by our institution, its strong leaders, and their commitment to bettering um, or to battling cancer disparities. It's committed to the compassion, the knowledge and the skills that our, um, our colleagues from different disciplines bring to the table. And it's also fueled by my family. Um, my redhead dad here, Steve, uh, in the middle here. As a young child, he grew up in the Lower West Side of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota and his best friends were from the black community. And he witnessed, witnessed great injustices when they were playing ball at the settlement homes there. And he wanted to fight that and fight for those injustices. So he actually served time on the local urban league and the national urban 
league. Um, and through time, I learned too that I wanted to fight injustices and, and um, promote health equity. Most recently, fueling my passion for cancer research is my sister, Rachel, and her new diagnosis of metastatic colon cancer. Similar, similar to Chadwick Boseman, she was diagnosed in her early 40s. Next slide, please. Pancreatic cancer is a leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States amongst both men and women. And of all the cancer types you see featured here, it has the lowest five-year survival at only around 10%. And if we don't change things by around 2030, pancreatic cancer will surpass colorectal cancer and be the second leading cancer killer in the United States, right after lung cancer. And part of the reason why is because the pancreas is located really deep in the abdomen it's not like it can be readily felt by a physician. It's not as easily seen by medical imaging. And when symptoms occur, such as back pain or, or abdominal pain or jaundice, which is yellow coloring in the eyes, uh, that happens very late in the disease process when the cancer has spread. Next slide, please. And we know this burden is particularly high in the black community. And if we look at the left and at the right of the page, we see that the number of new cases and the number of deaths are highest in the black population, followed by non-Hispanic whites, followed by Hispanic Latinx population, followed by other racial ethnic groups. And access to care and known risk factors such as smoking history or obesity don't fully explain these differences. And what's been troubling myself and many of us at, at my Moffitt and the George Edgecombe Society is the fact that um, studies that have been done to look at disparities are just explaining them. They're describing them. They're not addressing them. And that's something that we want to take care of here. Uh, and that's why I feel that we need to be looking at the biology of pancreatic tumors in the Black community to get a better handle on what's going on. Next, please. So one of the long-term goals of our research program here at Moffitt is to study the biology of pan pancreatic cancers amongst Blacks and develop strategies to minimize disparities, improve outcomes, and ultimately personalize care. And the best way I think we need to do that is with a multi-pronged approach. Uh, there are various factors in our lifestyles that may influence one's risk, such as cig cigarette smoking or alcohol use or red meat consumption. There are also socioeconomic Economic factors that need to be considered, but also we are well versed in molecular profiling or what I like to call blueprinting here at Moffitt, where we can look at an individual's tumor and find out more information about it. Another area where we're very well versed at Moffitt is quantitative imaging. And I think of this as a cool area whereby we can, um, we can identify features that might be invisible to the radiologist eye that can tell us about the underlying biology of a pancreatic tumor. And historically, quantitative imaging and this molecular blueprinting hasn't been applied to tumors from the Black population. And this is important because if we know information, that can help us to better predict if someone's going to respond well to certain therapies, if they're going to have adverse events from certain therapies. So really, we do want to tailor treatment to the individual, which is why it's very important that uh, individuals participate in studies and trials so we can help tailor care to them. So next slide, please. Uh, thanks to the George Edgecombe Society, our team was funded in 2018, and our team is made up of, of a group of us from different disciplines, and I'm co-leading this study with Jung Choi, who is an, a radiologist. Um, so our study involves evaluating for the first time those imaging features that I was just describing, as well as biological characteristics of tumors from a diverse population of individuals who have been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and treated here at Moffitt Cancer Center. And we want to determine whether those radiologic features from images are associated with race and ethnicity and various outcomes, and importantly, whether uh, the molecular makeup or blueprint of these tumors perhaps is different in Black individuals and perhaps uh, pairs or correlates with those imaging features. And these are pictures from um, the George Edgecombe annual event with the uh, Bar Association. Next slide, please. 
So we've been making uh, progress over the past couple years, a um, little bit slower than we'd like due to some obstacles beyond our control, but essentially this is the first time where a study is identifying a diverse um, group of cases with pancreatic cancer, a large proportion of which came from African Americans at the time of their surgery, and we're able to evaluate images, CT scans or commuted computed tomography scans from those individuals. Our radiologists have looked at them. They've performed those quantitative imaging analyses. And in parallel, we've requested tissue from our tissue archives. And a pathologist has looked under the slide at that tissue to verify um, the findings. And we're in the phase now where we're trying to integrate all the information. But I wanted to showcase for this audience something interesting that our team is discovering. So this is showing three images, one from an African an American female, one from a non-Hispanic white, one from a Hispanic Latinx individual, all with pancreatic cancers, and the yellow arrows are pointing at the tumor. So to the radiologist's eye, they don't really tell a difference, but in looking at certain quantitative metrics, if you will, um, we're finding that there are differences between the scan from the um, Black individual versus the other two, in that there's more underlying what we call heterogeneity or disorganization underneath, which could tell us about the aggressiveness of the tumor. So we are very much looking forward to disentangling this more uh, as we finalize the study and wouldn't be able to do this without the George Edgecombe funding. Next, please. The other thing we've been doing in the past two years is uh, very important and, and in part due to funds from the George Edgecombe Society, we've been able to get out and develop the first statewide partnership dedicated to advancing pancreatic cancer research with a strong emphasis on battling cancer disparities. So we've established an entity known as the Florida Pancreas Collaborative, and our goals are is so aligned with uh, the George Edgecombe Society and our mission at Moffitt. We want to study and address biological reasons for the higher rates of pancreatic cancer among Blacks, and we want to develop strategies to better diagnose and treat pancreatic cancer, improve quality of life and survival, and increase increase equity. And one of the most robust or powerful tools to do this is to build important infrastructure in what we call a biobank, which is essentially a large collection of biological and medical data and tissue samples that are compiled for research purposes. So we feel that by doing this, we are setting up important important and a strong foundation for years to come for a lot of investigators to investigate various hypotheses uh, that we hope we can address and help the Black community to increase health equity. Next slide, please. As part of this grant, which was funded by the Department of Health and the James and Esther King Foundation, we've been able to establish the first of its kind partnership with 15 institutions throughout our state, both academic cancer centers and community hospitals that never before had done a study like this. And we've part partnered with various community agencies. In the past two years, we've recruited nearly 400 participants. And I have to highlight the fact that about 26% of our population is from underrepresented populations that need to be in these studies so that we can personalize care. Um, so I'm very proud of our recruitment efforts. And as we'll see when we click in a moment, our reach is, is quite broad throughout the state. Um, as Kanisha is gonna click and show us, um, uh, Dr. Vataparampal's Office of Community Outreach, Engagement and Equity was able to map the zip codes from which our per participants derive. And they derive from all 15 counties within our catchment area, as well as 70% of all Florida counties. Now I see some gaps there, so do you. And that's where the, the, one, of the, um, one of the places where we could use help partnering together to get to those pockets of Florida that are untapped by our 15 community partners. Next slide, please. So I firmly believe that because of the George Edgecombe Society and the Florida Pancreas Collaborative, we've laid a strong foundation to have great impact in several areas in conducting translational research and increasing education, outreach and advocacy efforts in improving outcomes in health equity and in personalizing care for individuals diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Next slide, please. 
So what we're asking or what we're thinking as far as next steps is um, we uh, this is this is serious for us. We will keep battling and tr trying to get more money for this important cause for this important population. We've submitted two large grants to the National Cancer Institute. The most recent is known as an R01 mechanism and is actually involving another site outside of Florida from the University of Minnesota, Mississippi, who wanted to partner with our Florida pancreas collaborative because pancreatic cancer in the black community is highly prevalent in that population. So we're very excited about that. Uh, our final asks are for community members to join us in this mission. We wanna hear your stories. We want um, community advisory board members perspectives to be shared. Uh, we want to partner to educate the community in those pockets of Florida that are not represented in, in this research on the importance of research. And we would love to share what we're doing on social media. Next slide, please. So this work wouldn't have occurred in silo. We're thankful to the George Edgecombe Society as well as numerous other entities. Uh, there are a million people throughout the institution and throughout Florida that have um, participated. If we could just go two more slides, please. Um, so several institutions, as you're seeing here, and at the end of the day, I uh, wanted to dedicate this presentation in memory of the Trails Blazers who have lost their lives to pancreatic cancer. So thank you for your time. And again, thank you to the George Edgecombe Society for this opportunity to create a strong foundation for research in the Black community. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, so much progress in actually a short amount of time. So we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Yamoa, who will be telling us about his exciting work in prostate cancer. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks everyone on the call and thanks, uh, thank you to Kenesha for making uh, the presentations really run smoothly. Um, so what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna try in about maybe seven to 10 minutes, uh, most to try to go over a few of the work that we've been doing um, in basically prostate cancer among men of African origin, particularly in Florida, as well as um, in uh, the United States. So next slide. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, basically, I was born in Ghana. Um, I was the last of four children. Uh, my dad is a rebel minister. My mom is an accountant. Um, I had a quite rapid uh, academic trajectory. So I went to high school at seven, college at 13, and came to the United States really to pursue medical research. I uh, had a, did a PhD in New York City as well as uh, NYU and, and, and um, Sloan Kettering. Completed my residency in Thomas Jefferson University and a fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, focusing on molecular epidemiology. And I would say that through my mentorships uh, and global work, that led me to begin to study uh, the area of prostate cancer. And um, that that's pretty much sums up my story. Next slide. So I have to say that like most of us on the call, we've all been um, uh, touched in one way or another by cancer. My family has always been my inspiration. Um, so I also have my story. Uh, my son uh, was diagnosed with brain tumor and passed very early in, uh, in July of 2016. And my daughter Zoe um, and my wife Jamie continue to be my inspiration. And uh, I would say that I, I, I recognize a lot of us on the call just by um, looking around about all of us being touched one way or another. Sometimes it's you or a family member or someone you know. And we are all gathered here to really fight this. And I, I don't want to take this um, lightly that you're all here to really push this fight against cancer. Next slide. Uh, but today I want to focus on prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is really the number one uh, uh, common cancers among men across the globe actually, but this is the United States data and also the second cause of death among men in the United States. Next slide. And importantly, when you look at African-American men, that's actually a lot worse. Next slide. So in men of African origin, there is a higher prevalence and increased incidence. So across, when I say that, what I mean is that they're just getting the disease a lot more, um, and also they are dying from the disease a whole lot more, sometimes three times more. And this is not a question of, um, where you live because this is the same problem on the islands and on the African continent. And so it really goes down to, to become a problem that is really global, a global issue when it comes to prostate cancer. Next slide. And so um, we as a group at Moffitt with the help of the Judge Ecom Society have really dedicated our, our careers to really trying to understand this problem very, very well. And I have to say right out, out of the gate that 
we know that a disease is complex, it's multifactorial, there's a socioeconomic um, barriers, there's access to care barriers, and there are also biological factors. And in this talk, I will just focus on some of the biological factors that we are beginning to identify as important in uh, affecting the prostate cancer disparity across the globe. And because of the importance of that, I just wanted to zoom in a little bit with a picture here that shows you a diagram of the prostate. So here's a prostate. This is the gland, one, just one of the glands of the prostate. And what can occur is when you have tumors forming, they form these, you know, red dots you see over there. And some, in some instances, they just stay indolent. Simply means that they just stay in the prostate and do nothing. But in other instances, they can get very, very aggressive in a very, very short time and become metastatic. And which patients are in the indolent or less aggressive pathway versus the more aggressive? Okay. So the George Acom Society has been very much dedicated in trying to um, address. So as I mentioned to you, this is a global effort. And, and that actually brings me to a, a point that I wanted to emphasize that. Uh, this, like my, my colleagues mentioned, Jenny, that this is a global effort. This is an effort that requires entire communities and groups and people that are dedicated to this for decades. And this is just an example of what is going on across the globe in, in prostate cancer. We have a lot of representation in the United States, also on, on the African continent. And Moffitt Cancer Center is, is at the heart of this initiative. We have NIH grants uh, that has been uh, fueled by the George Gabriel Society that is going on. These are big program grants that are able to fund these across uh, different institutions. But this could not have happened without the seed uh, uh, money that was sown through uh, the George Gabriel Society. And I'll tell you a little bit why that's important. Next slide. So this is my lab. I just wanted to make sure that these are the ones that always keep the, the, the things going. None of us can do what we do it unless we have people who are really doing the hard work. And we just wanted to give a shout out there. Next slide. Um, so when, when we look at, next slide, when we look at the issue of uh, disparities, particularly in prostate cancer, there's a stark problem. And this is where you all come in. And at the end of, the, of my talk, I'll give a, a few uh, lessons we learned from these studies that. The, the, as long as we continue to do work in disparities, we need to collaborate and we need to work with uh, uh, clinical trialists as well as uh, patients that are willing to have us use biological specimens to understand the disease. Because as we move towards personalized medicine, where a person's uh, diet, exercise, lifestyle, all the factors that impacts their genome begins to impact the way they respond to treatment, the more we need to understand how each person's tumor responds to treatment. And that's where, through the help of the George Ecom Society, we were able to start a very groundbreaking approach where we're, we're generating uh, three-dimensional cultures from patients from African-American men to really be able to understand which tumors are more responsive to certain therapies and not. Next slide. And so with the initial funding, or we got this in the first year, the whole uh, um, approach was to really take the uh, tumor tissue right from the operating room and be able to bring it into the lab and begin to culture these cells, allow them to grow, and then test if they can respond better to different therapies. So this is just showing you a diagram of how you can take a, a tumor cell from, a, from a, a patient after they have had their surgery and, and really through certain uh, scientific exploration, be able to do either gene expression, protein analysis, and understand which drugs might work better so you can go back and deliver it to the patient. Next slide. So we were a very successful in our initial award to begin to get these cultures to grow. But then we learned a very important lesson. Next slide. We learned that like everything else, we live in a, in a village, we live in a community. So there's prostate cancer cells, right? They live in a community. They live in, their, in an environment where they have different types of cells. They have the luminals, they have the basal cells, they have the stroma cells. All these are terminologies that tell you that like in every community, you have different functions of people that do different things. Same thing with the prostate cancer, that we cannot fully understand the activities of the prostate cancer, why they behave the way they behave, unless we understand their microenvironment, their environment where they live in, their stroma microenvironment. And this, I, I believe, was the, well, really what turned the switch in a lot of our, our work and really brought us to, uh, next slide, to a place where we could really begin to answer specific questions for in prostate cancer disparities. So through George Ecom's initial seed funding, and at that point, by the way, it was we were the first group. It was 50K, $50,000. Now it's gone up to 75,000. Hopefully we get, it gets bigger. But with just $50,000, we were able to really do some groundbreaking work that led to a, a larger $1.7 million uh, DOD award from the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program to really study this, 
very question of patient-derived models to study the tumor microenvironment and how they respond to therapy. And so together with my very dear collaborators, Dr. Park and Dr. Rambula, we've developed a program that allows us to continue to do this work in a very, very uh, intricate way, way where within two weeks, we're able to get information right from the oral to about drug sensitivity to both um, and different medications as well as to radiotherapy to see which patients are better responders and to understand mechanisms to overcome resistant uh, disease. Next slide. So these efforts have already begun to pay dividends. So recently, last year, in the Moffitt News, actually, we, we published a paper in uh, one of the premier journals in the clinical uh, cancer research, showing that, indeed, the microenvironment of prostate cancer among African-American men is actually quite different. There, is a, there are some uh, immunosuppressive markers or features or, or almost like signatures, as we, we call it in, in the uh, medical world, that allow us to actually take advantage of those signatures to actually tailor therapies that might be more effective among the Af African-American population. So for the very first time, we are beginning to recognize that we are actually understand a mechanism that can actually allow us to improve outcomes in, a, in an African-American man with prostate cancer. I, th I think this is phenomenal. And in, in the last uh, few uh, months, we've had other groups also even corroborating our data. And so this verifies that we are actually onto something really, really uh, amazing here. And I think most of my collaborators on the call will, will attest to that, that this is really groundbreaking. And we cannot we, uh, thank George Combs' uh, involvement in making this happen. Next slide. So this is just uh, the future directions. This is, it gets a little more technical here, but I just wanted to uh, highlight a few cartoon, as you may, of certain things that we are understanding. So if you see this as a tumor cell, we believe that these tumor cells in African-American men may particularly respond better to radiotherapy and some immunotherapies because of the way this cell here kind of interacts with the other soldiers of the body. These are the monocytes and the lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes, they're like the army of your body that keeps guard against infections. Somehow they work in concert to allow us to fight disease as well, including cancer. And the more we understand how these soldiers of our bodies interact with our tum the tumors, we can better activate them and deploy them to help us fight cancer. I think this is a very fascinating field that you should stay tuned on. So next slide, I wanted to um, really end here with a few lessons we are learning as we continue to do this this work. As we continue to enroll patients on this you know, real-time prospective study of trying to really understand biology in real time as we treat our patients, we, re we realized a couple of things that even when the access is equal within a, a place like Moffitt Cancer Center, we are really offering our patients the best care we can get. We still recognize that there was still a disparity in, in delay to potential treatment and actually poor outcomes because there was some reluctance to participate on some of these clinical trials from our African-American colleagues. This is not no different from what we see in the COVID environment as well. And even after completing therapy, there was some reluctance in continuing to have follow-ups. Next slide. And I think these are the things that in collaboration with the COE and E, we are really beginning to partner with our patient advocates and our prostate cancer survivors. One of my dear friends, Major Bernie Morris, has been really working closely with me to really go reach out to communities, talk to them and say, listen, these are things that we need you to engage because without you, we cannot do this. And I sit here to talk about all this cool stuff, but I want to say that the real heroes are those that have gone ahead and are those that are fighting those battles because you guys make it happen. You know, God has blessed me with abilities to do this stuff, but without your help, all that comes to nothing. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of those on the call. And again, the last slide, I want to acknowledge a, a lot of people who have made all this happen. Last, next slide. Uh, uh, and all the awards that have come through and all the international collaborators that have made this happen. And more importantly, for the, uh, thanks to the George Eshkum Society uh, for really their support through this process. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Billy, for organizing this. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pramuth and uh, Dr. Yamoa. Uh, and I think all of you uh, can understand why they were the first two awardees of the George Edgecombe uh, uh, Foundation Award. Uh, they are doing some incredible work, and we are just so fortunate to have both of them doing this work at uh, Moffitt. So thank you both uh, for all of uh, the things that you're doing for our patients. Uh, and speaking of patients, um, we, we could not host this event. Uh, without getting a little personal and, and tying this back to our patients. Our patients obviously are the most important part of all of this. And so we have uh, attorney Lance Scriven uh, joining us tonight to share his story 
Uh, Lance, as many of you know, I think uh, most of us in the community know Lance. He's a prominent defense attorney uh, in the uh, Tampa Bay area and is the principal of, L of Lance Scriven Law. Uh, Lance has served as a special prosecutor for the Florida Judicial Qualifications Commission since 1994. Uh, he's very active in the local bar community. Uh, and in addition uh, to that, Lance devotes his time to civic and community organizations, including being a member of uh, the Moffitt Hospital Board. Uh, he's also a founding member of the George Edgecombe Society. Lance is a prostate cancer survivor. Uh, since being diagnosed with prostate cancer, he has become an advocate in helping to fight against cancer health disparities. So please welcome Lance Scriven. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm still trying to get over someone starting high school at age seven, but I'm sure it'll click in later. I am just delighted to be here um, and uh, speak for a few minutes of my own personal experience with Moffitt and how I've gotten to the point I am. And so my story with Moffitt begins actually around 2011 when I joined the uh, board or the foundation board. And I served on that board for um, about seven years. And when I joined the foundation board, I really joined because I knew it was important work uh, the foundation board is the charitable arm of the hospital. And cancer had uh, visited my family on four separate occasions. My father is a prostate uh, cancer survivor. Uh, my mother um, and sister uh, both survived breast cancer. And my grandfather uh, passed away from prostate cancer. And so I felt a sense of, uh, you know, serving, just learn more about, you know, this disease and how it affects it. Uh, not our community specifically, um, but just people generally. And then in 2017, through a confluence of events, things just changed. Uh, in 2017, you've heard that the George Edgecombe Society was formed, and I was asked to join that and was pleased to. And about three or four months later, I myself was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so I'm gonna be just very transparent and just tell you a few things about my experience. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, you know, what happened? I was feeling fine, minding my business. Uh, life was good. I actually was applying for some insurance and had a blood test done. And as a result of the blood work coming back with some abnormal results, um, I discovered that I need to go in and have my PSA check, which led to a biopsy, which led to a diagnosis um, July of 2017. You know, if you were to ask me, um, you know, how was the experience? Um, I'm a survivor. I actually have two friends that were diagnosed around the same time as me. Um, they're still going through treatment. Um, and so my, my story has a, a very, um, you know, happy ending. Um, I had a very curable form of prostate cancer. Two things that I um, had to undergo, uh, just very briefly, I was able to go through a procedure called brachytherapy, which is internal radiation, essentially, uh, followed by uh, five weeks of daily, um, it's called external beam radiation therapy. And Dr. Yamoa, you just heard from, is actually my uh, radiologist, oncologist for that purpose. And it was a, um, I mean, I, I would say I never felt alone because in my view, you know, this was um, an assignment from God. Uh, so I was never discouraged. Didn't really understand, you know, what was my, um, you know, burden to carry, but I was, um, you know, pleased to carry it because I always felt that God was with me. And I'll just tell you, I only had one really low moment. That was the uh, night that I had this procedure known as brachytherapy. Um, went to the bathroom um, and um, as we all do, and uh, tried to urinate 
and my bladder wasn't working. And the only thing I could compare it to that would make it kind of seem a little more real, when you get to the end of a ketchup bottle and you're trying to squeeze the last drop out and you just squeeze that bottle and just makes that kind of nothing's coming out. That's what I heard. And so my body wasn't, I'd never experienced that before. And I never thought that I would even have an issue going to the bathroom. And so that was my one moment where I think I, you know, maybe felt sorry for myself and thought to myself, now, why am I here? You know, why is this happening? Um, but as it turns out, um, the bladder being inflamed and um, affected by the um, internal radiation of the brachytherapy procedure is a very common side effect. Happened that one time. And that was really, uh, you know, the extent of my experiences where I really kind of felt, you know, why is this happening? Um, you know, by far, you know, my best experience was February 7th. That was the day that I uh, went to the cancer center and uh, finally received the news that my cancer was in complete remission and that I was cured. Um, and I had a wonderful team. Um, again, Dr. Fernandez, Daniel Fernandez, Dr. Yamoa, um, Dr. Julio Pasain, uh, just a, a really strong team. I was never in doubt where I was going to be treated because I knew Moffitt from my seven years there as a uh, board member. And so when it came time for you know, my treatment, um, there's never a question where I was going to go. And um, now we'll say this, I have one other experience I just want to share to just kind of give you an idea of the, the uh, degree of empathy. Um, you know, my physician actually prayed with me and my 58 years of living, I've never had a physician uh, start to give more, I mean, actually, you know, say a prayer for me uh, during the course of treatment. And that, you know, to this day, you know, of all the kind acts and I've had many compositions over the years, but that's, that's to this day, that's the one experience that I really uh, remember out of all of my um, you know, doctor visits in my 58 years. And so the last thing I would say is, um, you know, before I became a patient, you, know, you kind of hear casually, you know, one in seven men at some point will be affected by prostate cancer. And I heard that, and even though it had touched my family, it really didn't resonate because you know, I was never you know, one of those seven. And you kind of think, well, you know, one in seven, you know, what are my odds? We really didn't think about it that way, but it wasn't until, um, you know, I became the one and we can all become the one at some point. And I never thought I'd be the one, the one in the seven. And of course, for a uh, black African-American man, you know, it's an even lower ratio than one in seven, but I never thought I'd be the one, but I can say, you know, having, you know, gone from, you know, someone that was only marginally affected to, you know, being a patient and becoming that one, I cannot think of a, a better place to have received treatment. And it warms my heart so much because I know Dr. Greenwell and the staff um, in his, his staff and his department, I know how hard they've worked to bring this issue to the forefront of healthcare disparities. And as I sit here and I see the president and CEO of Moffitt attend this meeting and uh, the other uh, senior executives at Moffitt, I mean, there is real momentum, you know, there's real movement. And I just think there are people that care, I mean, that, that, that genuinely, you know, have a passion for what they're doing. And so they're not just looking at cancer health disparities um, as something to uh, do academically, they have a, a passion for it and a pursuit for it. So I'm very grateful. And anything you can do to support the effort of the uh, George Edgecombe Society, um, I really encourage you to do. The last thing I would say to Mr. Goldston, uh, thank you so much for your contribution and for your awareness. And um, as a survivor, I can say it is truly appreciated. And I'm sure your gift is going to go to uh, a very good wall, very good cause. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lance. Um, what a uh, powerful testimony. And thank you so much for your willingness to share your personal story and, and certainly for all of your support of the 
Cancer Center and the George Edgecombe Society. Lance said uh, uh, he and I know each other. Uh, he didn't tell you how well we know each other. Lance and I have known each other since we were uh, four or five years old. So we're practically like, uh, like brothers. So uh, many people don't know that, but uh, thank you. Uh, land so much for um, for being here. How tonight. can people help? Um, and I was talking about being a community advisor, really working with our team here at Moffitt and the George Edgecombe Society to inform our research and tell us how you feel in terms of the materials we present. Are they culturally appropriate? Do the methods that we're proposing for a study seem feasible? Um, just uh, sharing your story. If you've been touched by someone with a certain cancer, tell us about it. Um, shape what we do here. We, we really want to partner with you. I think uh, if I could add to that, Jenny, I think one of the things that has been increasingly important now for when we apply for grants and many uh, mechanisms of funding is the requirement for a patient advocate and for a member of the community to be inserted in the project, right? Somebody who not only starts from the design of that project, but will also follow the project throughout so that there is a guarantee that we're now not only closed on ourselves and our scientific questions, but actually we do things that matter uh, to the patient at the end. Well, welcome back everyone. Uh, we hope that you've been enlightened and are now more knowledgeable about the clinical aspects as well as the research and its impact on some of the cancers that are affecting the black community. I hope to, from learning about, you know, the history of the George H. Combs Society, from hearing from our researchers and clinicians, the testimony, the powerful testimony from Lance Scriven, that you now can get a sense of the great work, the calling of the George H. Combs Society to continue to work, to do this work on um, health disparities and its effect on the black community. But before closing, I must take a few moments, moments to acknowledge and to honor someone who has been a visionary leader, who his passion, his calling, his life's work has been devoted to addressing uh, diversity and inclusion and addressing health disparities. No initiative such as this could be birthed without a visionary leader. And with that, that person's passion fuels others to come along, to join and be a part of this great work. The individual that I'm speaking about has devoted his life's work to champion, to be a champion for diversity and conclusion. In fact, from 2016 through 2019, under his leadership, Moffitt was among Diversity Inc's top 10 hospitals and healthcare organizations for fostering diversity and inclusion. Not only is he the vice president of diversity, public relations and strategic communications at Moffitt, but he is also a researcher whose interest focuses on cancer health disparities. His personal testimony and that of his family helps to fuel his passion. His compassion is felt by all who, who interact with him and his leadership is impacting not only the great work here at Moffitt Cancer Center, but the Tampa community and beyond. Have you guessed him yet who we're speaking about? I'm speaking about Dr. B. Lee Green tonight. We have come together and have chosen to honor you, Dr. Green, for your dedication, for your commitment, for your institutional leadership, in improving the health of the black community in advocating passionately for the elimination of health disparities and for your visionary leadership and contributions to the George Edgecombe Society. We would not be where we are today had it not been for the visionary leadership that you have brought to this effort. We've all been touched. I can attest as on behalf of the Institute Board and the Hospital Board, the George Edgecombe Society and our steering committee, all of our donors, and all of those that have been a part of this amazing event tonight. I am so honored to present to you, and we have to do it virtually, this special plaque.
from the George Edgecombe Society at Moffitt Cancer Center. In honor of Dr. B. Lee Green, PhD, for your dedication, commitment, and institutional leadership in improving the health of the Black community. Awarded to you this day, February 11th, 2021. And I'd like to say, just take a, a moment of personal privilege. I have the honor. I'm a part of the Moffitt family because of Dr. Green. He introduced me and invited me to come and be a part of this Moffitt family. And it's his leadership that continues to motivate and propel this great effort and this work of cancer health disparities and particularly folks focus on the African-American community. So we, we applaud you and honor you. If we could all, you, you know, you would hear us roaring and cheering. <laughs> and so yeah. we want to acknowledge you and let you know that you, you're greatly appreciated. And uh, we are standing, holding up your arms, cheering you on, praying for continued strength because the vision is greater than what we have seen at this point. The call is great for this great work and the best is yet to come. And to those that are a part of this event tonight, I am so very hopeful that you have been empowered, that you have been uh, moved to action now to become a part of the George Edgecombe Society in whatever way you choose to. You can see the benefit and the outcomes of the grant awards and how it is impacting this research. So we extend to you an opportunity to come along with us. There's greater work to be done. And so I know Dr. Green, you do wanna, did you want to have some remarks? And um, I will uh, let you do that. And then I do want to thank the participants tonight before we conclude. So Dr. Green. The, the only thing I want to say is that you all are in big trouble. <laughs> I, I'm not sure whose idea this was, but you all are in big trouble. Susan and Clement and Kanisha, you all, um, you all are in big trouble. That's all I can say. Um, you know, I, I, I you know, don't like... Uh, personal accolades. And the reason I don't is because there are so many incredible people that I work with every day um, who um, really should be getting the credit uh, for all of this. Uh, but I do appreciate the recognition. Um, and just um, it's just an honor to work at a place like Moffitt. Moffitt is uh, special. I've heard uh, Dr. Who uh, in his first 100 days talk about what an incredible place this is. It is an incredible place. The best job that I've ever had. Um, and I'm just so appreciative and uh, just work with the most um, incredible people ever. Uh, so thank you so much for um, the recognition, but you're still in trouble. So thank you. <laughs> well, Dr. Green, we thank you. And to, to each and every one of you that are participating tonight, this could not have been uh, a successful event without your participation. And again, we'd like to thank certainly to the entire team, a special shout out to Kanisha Avery and the entire team that has worked for every department that has been a part of this. Uh, we do uh, applaud you. This was a team effort and a lot of planning has gone into this process. So we thank you all, each and every one to the elected, elected officials, to Dr. Who and Dr. Cleveland for your involvement in this event tonight. Uh, is this is very special for us as well. And to all the George Edgecombe Society uh, donors and to the steering committee for all of your support. And so we just thank everyone for all that has been involved. And uh, we do wanna remind you that this is not the end. This is just the beginning. And we hope now that you're prepared to partner with us with the George Edgecombe Society to help us to continue to mobilize and inform the black community to support the minority health disparities work and research that is going on here at Moffitt in many different areas and make a commitment now to share, to spread this information with others. And now as you have been informed, we have an obligation to now spread the word and invite others to be proactive in their health care. Uh, there's been some vital information that was shared tonight that I believe and we believe that, that will change lives. This is about changing lives. So we do want to thank each and every one of you. And I see Dr. Who there. Dr. Who, you may want to also have some comments uh, as we prepare to close. I want to give you, extend that opportunity to you as well. Thank you, Valerie. And thank you to everyone. This is such an important issue. Uh, and I can see uh, that, that we are making huge progress and we'll make, this is just the start though. 
we'll make uh, even more progress with this momentum. So thank you for spending the evening with us. I'm just so proud of all of you for the efforts you're making. Thank you, Dr. Hu. And uh, lastly, thank you again to each and every participant, to all the clinicians and researchers and everyone who has played a phenomenal role in making this evening's event a success. We thank you from the bottom of our heart as the chair of this initiative, the George Edgecombe Society, on behalf of our entire steering committee and all that are part of this. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you can expect, uh, look forward to an email to come back asking for your feedback and sharing some additional information with you all about how to connect and ways in which you can become further involved with this great work. So uh, Dr. Greenhouse, give you the last word if there's anything else you'd like to share as we wrap up the evening. Uh, thank you so much, Valerie. Um, really appreciate uh, you all being here, spending a couple of hours with us. Uh, what a great program. And thanks once again to uh, Kenesha for doing all of the uh, heavy lifting. Uh, and as Valerie said, uh, we are just beginning. So we look forward to your partnership moving forward. Uh, so you all have a uh, safe and wonderful uh, evening and uh, look forward to hearing from us very, very soon. Yes. So good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.